All right, so I'm just going to jump right into this. Um, for everyone that is showing up now, I'm going to go over a little bit of how my seminars typically go um, in terms of rules and so on. So first thing about my seminars is I want to keep the chat very clean. Um, I don't want any kind of like copy pasta or anything trolly. Um, I got mods ready to just be Nazi mod and just instantly time out people that spam stuff like that. Save it for when I play solo queue. Um, for now, I just want the chat to be about the seminar itself. Um, the next thing here is that there's going to be slides specifically that say ask questions. Um, hold your questions um, towards like when I'm discussing like a topic, topic, just hold your question until the question slide. Usually after every like slide that discusses a topic, there's going to be a question slide where you're going to be more than welcome to drop a message um, and ask questions. And please do. I, I highly encourage everyone to you know spam with questions. If you're curious about something um, on the topic or in slight relation to the topic, shoot it that way. After the um, after like the seminar is over, there's also going to be a time where you can ask questions related to the game. Um, like not to the game, sorry, to the, the seminar or even unrelated to the seminar. So if you have any questions about the game, whatever, like how to improve last hitting or whatever that may be, you can ask it after the seminar is over. Um, the seminar is estimated to be around 45 minutes long, um, just kind of depending on how the conversation goes. And, you know, if it goes later, that's totally fine. Um, it just kind of depends on how many questions people have. Because if I was just to talk through the seminar, it would only take like 15 to 20 minutes, if that. So with that being said, um, Let's talk about the topic here, which is all about trading. So overall trading, the, like the purpose of the seminar is to one, introduce the idea of trading to people, but two, um, talk about things that like strategies that will help you improve your trading as a whole. So moving on into that, let's get started here. Um, the discussion points we're going to talk about is, first of all, I'm going to define trading. Uh, the second thing would be um, talking about something called a champion's zone and how that can improve your trading. The next thing is understanding the nature of matchups and how that can improve your trading. <laughs> Identifying effective HP of the matchup and how that can improve your trading. You're seeing the trend here, right? And the final thing is considering outside factors. This is kind of like a filler slide that's going to cover a lot of other things that I don't want to make a ton of slides on. Um, so we'll talk about that kind of stuff there. So um, moving on here into the first slide, defining trading. Now, this is the first um and only slide that is not going to have a question area after it, just because I'm just going to define trading. Most people here probably know what trading is, but for those who are newer to the game, um, I want to kind of explain what's going on here. So um, trading essentially is when your champion has an exchange with an enemy champion. So if you both auto attack each other, that's a trade. Even if you auto attack and they don't auto attack you back, that's still a trade. Anything that a champion does with another champion is considered a trade. Um, and generally, you want to trade with purpose. Like, you want to be winning trades. And the idea behind the seminar is to start helping you win those trades more often to overall improve your laning phase in general. So that being said, let's move into the, the first main topic here in regards to trading. So, mastering your champions is zone. The first and pretty much the most important thing about understanding trading is how you should create a trade in being knowledgeable about how those happen. So every champion has a zone of influence. And essentially that champion's zone of influence is a champion's range, right? Um, I'm gonna show you an in-game example of this, um, but it's very important for the champion that you main to, like, you need to know down to a T that champion's zone of influence. When you know that zone of influence, you could really do some like really nice trades. And that's how you see like players that are higher, like ELO, just bully people in lane. Like if I'm smurfing, I just bully people in lane over and over again. It's because I'm really good at knowing my champion's zone. And it's likely that my opponent isn't good at that. So they're just getting to schooled without having any idea like what I'm doing. They're like, wow, this guy's good. He's so confident. I don't know how to react to his play. And it's because I know my champion's zone. So let's go into an in-game example here. I want to just talk about the zone a little bit just to show you guys what I mean by this. So what I'm going to do is switch to this, hop into a custom um, training game real quick. And what we are going to do here, so we're just going to pick Caitlyn. Caitlyn's like the queen of zone, obnoxious as all hell. And I just want to talk about Caitlyn's zone. So let's get into this game here. And again, after 
after I'm done talking about this slide, we'll have a, um, a question slide where you guys can ask as many questions about champion zone control. You can even ask me specifically about certain champions and how their zones interact and all that kind of stuff. You can shoot me all the questions in the world. All right. Cool. So let's get in here. Let's just say Caitlyn is level three. All right. Now, let's wait for the screen to unlock the crew. There we go, the gates. Now, what we want is a enemy target dummy. This will help. Bingo. All right. So, there are a couple things that define Caitlyn's zone. The most important one is her auto attack range. A champion's auto attack range is their base zone. So, as an example, Caitlyn's base zone is the, as far as this circle goes. So essentially, if I want to create a trade with an opponent, I will move my zone into theirs and attack them, right? It seems very basic, but when you actually think about this kind of stuff in game, it makes a huge difference. So another thing that influences the champion's zone is their ability range. And a huge thing about this is understanding how ability range is like is influenced as abilities go on cooldown. This is a, a huge thing. So as an example, like my range on Caitlyn when my Q is up at level three is like this far. This is my zone essentially, right? So when that's down, my zone goes from that far down to this range. And that means if a champion hypothetically has a zone that can move into my champion zone from there, they can harass me while my Q is down without any threat. And that's really important to realize during laning phase and so on. So overall, that's one of the biggest points I wanted to go over about zone. Caitlyn's just a, a very easy example to show how zone works. So like as an example, right now I'm pushing my zone into the target dummy, which allows me to trade with it. And get that damage, just random free damage off. And if I was to explain through a laning phase, I could just easily show you over and over again how like, okay, while this target dummy is going for a last hit, I'm going to move my zone into its, and I'm going to harass it as it tries to last hit, as an example. So there's a lot of ways that understanding champion zone and becoming the master of your champion zone will help you. That way, like, let's say that I'm playing bottom lane and I'm against a Vayne, right? So Vayne's attack range is much lower than Caitlyn's. So I could easily move into my, um, in, like, my range into the Vayne and just harass her without her being able to answer back unless she was, like, to tumble into me, which that was, that's a whole other story because that's she's using her one escape to get inside my zone to harass. That's super important to break down um, to become effective at trading. So now we can move outside of that, um, this game example here, and we can move back into the slideshow. Move this out of the way. All right. So now with that being said, let's ask questions and have a discussion about champion zone and so on. So I'm gonna go ahead and just take a peer off into the, um, to the chat. I've been kind of ignoring chat on purpose. Uh, but now, any questions about a champion zone? Let's say that you have a main and you're like, hey, I'm just curious about this champion zone. Or in this matchup, I have questions about this kind of thing in regards to trading and zoning. Shoot them my way. Um, this is this is part of the discussion here, part of the seminar. So Jayhawk uh, mentioned Pantheon is a good zoner as well, though he is about ability zoning. Yes, absolutely. And that's one reason why Pantheon's really strong in lower elo ranges is players don't understand zone. So they don't have to know they don't know how to play around Pantheon in his zone um, in the early game. How do you force people to zone certain ways? That's a really good um, question. So as an example, something like when you're saying I'm being zoned, what do I do? That essentially means that, okay, as an example, Caitlyn is pushing her zone into me over and over again. And one thing that you can do, um, like as an example, is if you're zoning a champion, like they want to last hit, right? So you're either forcing them to move outside of EXP in gold range by just making it so they can't last hit or Vayne's gonna feel like I need to get last hits so she has to move inside Caitlyn's zone to get harassed while last hitting um, what if the zones are equal then that's when trades are going to happen a lot and that's often um, due to the fact that um, that's why like there's like a lot of skill matchups that are quite bloody is due to that and it's, then there are some other things craft that's a really good point um, and there's going to be other topics that are going to discuss where there's going to be a lot of strategies around equal zones. All right. Um, Echo zone of influence. I've been practicing a but It's a little tricky to know a zone because of his in his his Q. Yeah, so Echo's zone um, of influence would be, yeah, his Q and his E. When his Q is on cooldown, his zone of influence is his then is his E, right? Um, so that's around, like, you know, Echo's 
area of pressure is like you know jumping onto someone and so on so yeah um echo's zone is very um cut and dry and easy to understand this is just like the stepping stone the first the first step in understanding trading is there a way to effectively um efficiently learn and how to play around other people's zone when you don't know the enemy champion zones yes go into a custom game and then just look at their uh, like ranges <laughs> that's a really good way of learning it the unfortunate thing is you don't own that champion that can be a little bit rough so i would suggest maybe like looking up videos or something and just learning those champions ranges find a friend that owns a champion and then 1v1 against them and just learn how your ranges interact with theirs um jayhawk asks in certain matchups is it more important to zone the enemy over farming um generally speaking that's like a slippery slope because that's like a blanket statement that i'd hate to give because it, it there's a lot of circumstances um that go into that but generally if your champion um does not outscale the enemy's champion so the longer the game goes um the better that the enemy is off then yes zoning them and making it so they can't scale is worth a bit more than farming but never should you give up all of your farm to try to zone them it's just considering the matchup example um okay if you're bot lane how do you play against two zones then you need it's just it's the same thing it's just understanding how both zones interact like with your two zones in lane as well so you need to understand like let's say against you're against vane and lulu then you need to know lulu's range as well like her zone as well and like when her q is down what is her zone then and that's how like you know you become like the master of laning phase is you know every champion zone that you play against and then you can never like you know you don't let yourself get harassed against a certain laners or maybe you're okay with them harassing you because you out trade them because you know the damage output and some other concepts we're going to cover in the future as well how do you prioritize um trading over farming That kind of depends. Generally speaking, most people will say that you should prioritize farming over trading, um, but there are other times where you could do both, and we're gonna get into that. How do you zone people away from CS? You force your zone into theirs while they try to CS. So, like if you're playing a, like a long range poke champion, when the champion goes up the poke, you, you hit them and be like, no. You may not be able to stop them from getting last hits, but you're going to punish them for last hitting. All right, we had some great questions. I'm gonna move on now. If you had any other questions, we can just we can bounce back on them um, uh, after the seminar is over. All right, so let's move forward here. Understanding the nature of the matchup. Another very big talking point here. Every matchup has circumstances to consider. So, um, and this will often influence trading. So there's a lot of things you guys are bringing up and the reason why I wanted to move forward is because it's going to cover that area. So um, as an example, the nature of the matchup between Lux versus Ari, uh, one, Lux is a mage and Ari is considered as an assassin for the most part, right? So as an assassin, you have to ask yourself, what is stopping me from killing this champion? And as an example, Lux, there's a couple things that's like stopping an Ari from killing Lux. One, her bind, right? If Ari ults and gets like, just gets bound by Lux's Q, she can't really chase and get the kill. The next thing is maybe um, Lux has flash, right? That could also be stopping Ari from aggressing. But let's say that Lux like aggressively throws her Q um, Ari could then answer that by dodging Lux's Q with her R and it either forces a flash or kills Lux because Lux may not have flash or she gets the flash and kills Lux. So understanding how your champion interacts due to the nature of the matchups, a really important way of understanding trading also. Um, it's also important to understand the nature of the matchup. Like you may have been in a matchup that you should never trade with the opponent for multitude of reasons. One reason, which is called effective HP, we'll get, in, we'll get into in the next slide. Um, but there are matchups as an example where your champion heavily outscales the other. Let's say you're playing a hyper carry, right? Let's say you're playing like um, Jinx and the Draven. Like as Jinx, you should like never trade into Draven, right? For so many reasons. But a really big reason is that Draven's an early game um, AD carry while you're playing Jinx, which is seen as like a hyper carry late game AD carry. So that nature of that matchup means that, okay, I shouldn't even trade just given like the, like the law of the land and i should just force myself to farm instead of like you know be focusing on harassing and forcing my zone into his to harass him and force trades down while draven on the other hand would constantly want to be putting his zone into jinx to harass jinx you know so covered two lanes there um similar in top lane as well um overall this concept is pretty is simple on paper but can get complicated um just due to like there's a lot of matchups in the game some matchups are similar while others are really different but it's definitely a really big topic to understand around trading. 
So with that being said, questions on here. I expect a, I honestly expect quite a bit of questions here. So shoot them my way. You just get to know how the matchups are going to go by experience. It's a good question. Um, yes. So learning through experience is obviously, you know, one of the best ways of learning. Um, what you can do as an example, let's say that you play a matchup and you get destroyed. A really good way of learning that also is by after you play out the matchup, look over the replay and just look what you do and what the enemy does and ask yourself who was making mistakes um, and really... Um, tried to break that down. That's another really good way of like, is reflecting to learn about matchups, you know, experience it, then reflect. Does the jungle have any concept of trading as well, even though it's not a lane? Yeah, in some ways, um, you know, if you end up into a, a duel with the enemy jungler, um, another thing is like trading camps. Like if the, he invades on you trading, it's just different concepts in some other ways. Um, but generally speaking, it's like, it's a whole nother world. It's like, an, it's like a very different topic to talk about. Um, Jayhawk, in some matchups, is it better to just tower hug and miss farm um, than to get into their range, such as Draven versus Jinx lane? Being down 20 sets is better. Yes, absolutely. It is. There are many situations where the nature of the matchup is that you just have to concede a lot of the laning phase and just try to not fall behind in experience. Um, in that matchup, like as an example, you could lose farm, but it's really nasty to fall behind in experience too. So you're going to try to stay in experience range, but not like eat Draven axes. So yeah. Big thing. When you're getting destroyed in the early lane, how do you come back if you're a late game champ? So um, one thing, um, Z King, is that League of Legends has catch-up experience, right? So they, like Riot has put in mechanics in the game that if you fall behind, you gain more experience than others would. So there are things in the game to help you get back into the game. There are a ton of things. Riot has been making the game more and more like orientated around like rubber banding and, and comebacks. So... You just need to play it safe, not feed, not tilt, and just focus on farming. Like, if you need to let your tower fall, don't sit in a turret and let the champion kill you. Let the tower fall, concede the turret, and then just catch, you know, catch the wave. Communicate with your team, get vision up, and just constantly focus on the thing of hand of being like, we just got it. What, whatever we need to do to get this game to, like, 50 minutes, we got to do it. And you ask yourself, how does that happen? Maybe it's warding and conceding turret and turrets. Maybe it's just siege, like, you know, um, creating an anti-siege scenarios where you guys just turtle out under turret in some areas. Um versus giving up turrets and others, it's comes it comes pretty specific towards like the game situation, but there are a lot of ways of doing it. A big thing is vision control and conceding objectives. There's like a lot of people that would fight over Ocean Dragon when they're 5k behind when they outscale. It happens all the time and that should never happen. Next thing, I find pot management is pretty important in some matchups that are heavily focused on harass and poke. Yes. Um, Ibrim, we're gonna go over that a lot in the next slide. Over over effective HP. How do pro players always get such high CSing even when the... Okay, so that's a good question, Exiled. So there, there's some depth here. So one thing about like pro, like because there's a difference between high, like high ELO solo queue and competitive matches. So one thing about competitive matches and the reason why CS is always so high in competitive matches is that they have vision down like everywhere. In losing matchups, what teams will do is that they create extra pressure on that side of the map to like support it. So let's say that, like we talked about Jinx and Draven, so we'll use that example again. Let's say that um, a pro team is playing like Draven Thresh, right? It's a very aggressive lane. And the other team is playing like, you know, um, Tristana, because Tristana's meta right now, Tristana and like Nami or something. Clearly Tristana and Nami is in the losing lane, but the pro team will have the jungler on the bot side of the map a lot. And the enemy team knows that. So they can't play aggressive because they know that, you know, Gragas is just waiting for them to play aggressive. <laughs> And while it's true they lose pressure on one side of the map, their top side, they'll pick a top side champion to support themselves. Like they'll pick a winning matchup in top lane, give the bottom lane the losing matchup to scale, and then just use their jungler to pressure that side of the map so that Trisana can still get her CS and not be like getting tower dove. That's how it happens in in like professional matches. And in solo queue, I mean there are games where the CS there is drastic CS differences, but 
and but they come back because they understand just like how I talked about they understand how to play from behind and and you know get their CS up by freezing waves and and letting their turret fall and you know doing that kind of stuff. It's a really good question, Exile. Do we have any more questions on the topic of nature of matchups? How do you freeze? Okay, so freezing is on a totally different topic, not really even related to trading, but we'll talk about it a little bit. Generally speaking, freezing is when you force um, a minion wave to be equal with the other one and just stay it, you just keep it there. Sometimes you'll have to use your champion, it's like actual champion, like you just face tank a wave to make sure it doesn't run into turret. And you just keep it there and it'll be like a slow push eventually, but you can keep a freeze for quite some time. How do you break a freeze when you're behind? Get your jungler to help you push the wave out. It's one thing. That's a really big thing. Okay. What if the matchup you don't know how it goes? What do you do? Do you make an educated guess and you learn from it? Like, you're like I have no idea what to do in this matchup, but I think I outscale them or I think I beat them in trades due to a lot of reasons. Then you just do it. And if it doesn't work, you learn from it, right? That's a big thing about it. It's playing proactively and with your mentality in there is how you learn. If you're a Pantheon who has been ganked a few times, do you still try to deny the enemy laner? It kind of depends. If you're still, you're like, one, vision control is huge. Like, you should never, like, let yourself get ganked, like, quote-unquote, a few times. You should not die over and over again to ganks. You get vision up. If you get ganked the first time and die, you're like, okay, it's clear that the enemy jungler is going to pressure me because I'm Pantheon and I want to snowball. So I'm going to get vision up so I, I don't get ganked as easy. And then when you see, when you know the enemy jungler is not around because you see them elsewhere, that's when you can pressure them. But in the event that you do find yourself super far behind, then... If you're still, if you still know that you can kill the champion, um, and you get that vision up because you finally learned from it, then yes, you should continue to um, to pressure. But eventually, if you're against a champion that's going to hard, let's say you're against Gangplank, but you're two levels behind Gangplank, Gangplank's still going to kill you regardless. So in that event, you're going to have to farm and then look to like snowball the map elsewhere, like ulting bottom lane after you're level six, as an example. If it's a bad matchup, could you ask an ally laner for a lane switch? In theory, you could, but I don't suggest it, just because people don't properly use lane swaps. Like even in high, like even in high diamond, people don't understand how to do it correctly in a lot of ways. So generally, you just need to learn how to play a, um, a bad matchup. There, are, there are very few things such as like counter picks. Those don't really exist. Um, it's just there's just bad matchups, and you need to learn how to play bad matchups. Like as like if you if you're learning like you need to learn your champion's bad matchups and how to survive them and what you need to do to win the game in those bad matchups. You shouldn't try to band-aid fix it by lane swapping. All right, so let's move on to the next slide here. Understanding effective AP. This is a huge talking point. It's been brought up, like there are some, there's been people that have asked directly kind of in a, in a different way about effective HP. It's been brought up by a lot of other questions and I'm, I wanna get into this too. So effective HP equals all HP considering HP pots, abilities, passives, runes, masteries, all of that jazz. Knowing effective HP should directly influence your trading by a, by a long shot. When you when you're in loading screen and you're asking yourself like you know how do I trade? There are there are a couple things. One, you need to be like okay, well, how do our zones interact? Two, what's the nature of the matchup? Three, what's the effective HP? Those are the three keys to success while trading. Okay. So, considering effective HP, you know you got to be like okay, who's going to out sustain one another? So like you know. Does this champion have any ways outside of HP potions that are going to regenerate their HP? Do I have other ways? Because if that's the case, you can take a trade that you technically would lose, like where they may do 220 damage to you, but you only do like 190 damage to them. But if you have more effective HP, you win that trade on paper. And just taking those trades over and over again as you out sustain them is how you will starve out your enemy laner and get a lead. Yes, like Trinimer Q, like Ari Passive, like Vladimir Q. Like Soraka heals, Nami heals, um, even the, the mastery, um, Warlord's Bloodlust gives you heals, you know, lifesteal essentially. Um, you know, um, Grasp of the Undying is another keystone that will give you um, more effective HP. Doran's Shield gives you more effective HP. Doran's Blade gives you more effective HP. HP potions do. So, like, as an example, you may be, you may even die, right? You may die in lane to a champion. You come back in the lane with three HP potions. The enemy laner has no HP potions. You can take a lot of micro trades with them, even though they have a slight lead, as long as you don't let yourself get all in. And you'll out, you'll out sustain them. There's been so many times where I've been working with a student where they get a lead. We'll look over a replay of them or something. And they're like, okay, great. You killed them. You played that lane really well. But then they come to lane with no potions. Enemy, po enemy laner has potions. 
they trade with them and then they're like oh my god like i'm just like they're like they're stuck at 10 percent life and they have to recall if they lose their lead the enemy laner gets exp advantage and then eventually the enemy laner kills them because they didn't respect effective hp yes jayhawk exactly shields count as well shield heals all that jazz and effective hp should tr you know directly influence the way you trade so if you're against like a shielding champion um you know you should definitely consider that um in your matchup that is another thing to heavily consider around trading and so on. So overall, the concept itself is pretty straightforward, but I expect some questions on it. So now you guys may ask questions in regards to um, understanding effective HP and so on. Also, on another note, Corrupting Potion, another big area of effective HP to understand. Because one, not only does it give a champion regeneration, it also gives them bonus damage while trading. So should I be buying pots pretty often? That's a dangerous thing. Generally speaking, in early laning phase, though, like up until level 8, if you're going to be 1v1ing a lot, it's a really good idea to have at least one potion on you. That way you can pop an HP potion while you're fighting as well. So, like, let's say you jump into, like, a 1v1 fight and you expect it to last a while, maybe even an all-in. Having an HP potion running is, like, essentially adding 100 extra HP onto your health bar. Unless you get ignited. Then that's a different story. Then it's, like, you know, a different number. Depending on, like, when the Grievous Wounds is applied. I usually buy refillable early. It entirely depends on what lane and what champions you play. Refillable can be really good on some champions, while others it's not that great. So would barrier or heal be... Um, no, not necessarily. Um, it depends on the champions you're playing and if you prefer kill pressure over that bonus effective HP. So say I don't have current effective HP, but I know I... Was, or should I trade knowing that I'll... Which, for example, Sway Null. Yes, exactly. Having that, like, that's another example. Another example would be Ari, right? Ari's will make trades even though their Q passive isn't up, but they know that their Q passive will be up after, like, you know, using, like, one more Q. And then they're like, I lost that trade, but my Q, will be, my Q passive will be up for next wave, but I can heal off of it. So, yes. As long as the enemy champion can't heavily punish you in that trade for not having the effective HP yet, it's a perfect play. And it, just, it shows, like, mass champion mastery. It's really good. Do you think it's better to buy a part of a core item on a champion or some pots? So, as long as you are not missing a, a huge core completion, then it's fine. But if you have the option of completing like a... Um, let's say that you're playing like Echo in lane, right? And um, you're going to get the um, the gun, the revolver part of the, your item. That's a huge power spike for Echo. And I would probably consider picking that up over... Um, over an HP potion because your win condition is just a quick like you know like kill push out the lane um, and then roam and that HP potion isn't really going to help you much with that um, but if you're in a matchup where you want to sustain and you scale it, it depends on your champion's win condition the nature of the matchup is another important thing on that so it depends if you're going to be trading a lot or roaming or looking just to get a, a quick all in or, or whatever it may be but if you're struggling in lane yes How do you face someone with a lot of effective HP more than you? For example, Kali, you don't trade with them. <laughs> so if, if a champion has a superior effective HP to you, the, the, the trick is to never trade with them. Never fight them. Just farm. Only fight them when you have a gank. That's, I just answered two questions in one. Great questions, guys. You never want to trade with them. Like Vlad, never trade with them. Back up. When he runs at you, you run away. That's understanding zone control, right? You understand Vlad's Q range. Never let him get in there. If he runs at you, you run away. Ibrahim, that's bad advice. Short trades is not good because she's still going to sustain back up. If you had to choose between a pot or controller, what would you choose? It depends on the matchup. Um, generally speaking, if I feel like I need that potion, I'm going to take the potion. But if I feel like, okay, I don't necessarily need that potion that much, control would be better, especially if you're expecting jungle pressure. If you're playing mid lane and you are losing, you have around 900 gold, should you go for the mini... Um, Morello Namicon, or go for a Dawn's Ring and Boots. Um, it depends on the champion you're playing. Um, assuming that you already have a Dawn's Ring, double Doran's is nerfed. It's not terrible, but it is nerfed, so that is less value. Um, so I'm assuming you mean Lost Chapter um, versus um, Doran's and Boots. 
And generally speaking, Lost Chapter is going to be better than those options, but it kind of depends on the matchup. Ignax, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, yes, in some ways. Like, if you're going to be trading with them a lot, actually recognizing that they have a refillable and mirroring that purchase wouldn't be bad. Like, maybe recalling me, okay, I need to pick one up too. Happens a lot in top lane. I remember specifically a pro player was asked about this, and they specifically said, like, it's like a weird thing where it's like, okay, he buys it, I need to kind of buy it too. But if they no one either has it and people don't consider they need it, they won't. But it's a good question. It, it kind of goes back to when Doran's Ring were a thing. Like, a lot of matchups where, like, people were playing Nautilus and Gragas top, they they had the same reasoning behind Doran's Rings. It's like, if the enemy Gragas buys two or three ones, I have to buy two or three as well to be able to deal with them. Same idea. Good question. Um, which would be better in a matchup that could go either way? Longsword, three pots, or Doran's Blade in pot? I mean, I'm assuming that you mean at level one. And if it's at, if, if you're going walking to a lane at level one, as long as you're not expecting to, like go for an all-in very early on, Longsword's better. But if you're expecting to all-in that champion early or get jungle gank pressure, then Doran's Blade's pretty solid because it provides more in that, like, early 1v, like, 1v2 or 2v2. Do you trade against Kled that has Skarl up because they can just remount? That's a good question. Generally, Kled's, like, really good, but he can get bullied early lane, laning phase. So generally you should trade against Kled um, on a lot of matchups and just bully him off of Skarl and then just prevent him from remounting, forcing him to recall the mount back. Which is better, a mastery point now, cookies or assassin? The large majority of the time it's going to be cookies, assuming that you're laning. Cookies is still great. Cookie gives you guaranteed value, while Assassin is value that is very, like, circumstantial. Same can be um, said about Cloth Armor Drawn Shield. Um, yeah, Jayhawk, kind of. What is Cookies? Cookies is the mastery called Secret Sash, which will change your HP potions into cookies, which um, I think they're technically called Biscuits. And they give you a little bit of like they give you a little bit of instant um, heal when you eat them, and they also the mastery also makes it so your potions last longer, so they heal a little bit more. All right, we're gonna move on to the next slide now. Considering outside factors, okay, this is a big one, no, but the last one here. So another um, some other outside factors that should influence your trading is understanding scaling. So. Um, some people brought up that brought this up already. Like, you know, what if I'm playing a champion that I know, like I get outscaled by, like, should I force trades on them? The answer is usually yes. Um, but also understanding like itemization power spikes is really big level power spikes and ultimates, how they change trading as an example, like Lux is like a really strong trader until like level six, which typically she becomes a much weaker trader post six because the majority of people she's landing against have way bigger power spikes than Lux does post six. Like. Ari versus Lux. Like, Ari can kill Lux after 6. Syndra versus Lux. Syndra can kill Lux easily after level 6. And the list goes on, right? So that's a, that's a strong way of, like, recognizing these factors as well, considering trading is, like, scaling. As champions scale into the game, how do the trades affect the matchup? This is technically, like, falls under the nature of the matchup, but wanted to bring this up again because itemization is also a big thing. Like, if the champion has Banshee's Veil, it changes the way you trade with him and so on. Now another big thing is jungle pressure. So let's say you're playing Fizz um, and you want to be harassing and trading a lot with the enemy Lux because you have more effective HP, you have more damage, your win conditions to kill them, and so on. You want you want to be able to, um, to understand jungle pressure when making these trades because you are pretty much all inning when you go in for a trade because you don't have many ways of getting out when you go in. Um, and understanding jungle pressure is really important because a lot of people will see all of these factors where it all is a green light. They're like, green light, I need to trade. I outscale. I have more. Um, I have longer range and zone potential. I have more effective HP, so I should bully them, right? But then they just get owned by the jungler over and over again. So it's important to respect and understand the enemy jungler um, and play around that accordingly. Really important. Really, really important. Um, so... That's something to understand. The final thing is trading to create timing windows. Now, 
this is something really big to um, to recognize here. So I mentioned this earlier, but forcing trades that you may technically lose out slightly to create a timing window is important. So let's say you're playing against a champion that has an escape, right? They have an ability that makes them dash or fly, like Tristana W, Caitlyn Net, um, Fizz E, Katarina E, you know, the list goes on, the mobility. But if you force a trade to burn that, to create the timing window of it being on cooldown, like Zed Shadow, Morgana Shield, you know, keep going on there. Um, forcing a trade, you may lose, but to create a timing window so there that cooldown is down for whatever reason, either for you to re-engage on them now that ability is down, so you can land a skill shot, or for your jungler to gank, and so on, is a really important strategy around trading. So that's another like outside factor I wanted to include. Technically, I feel like that could have its own uh, its own slide as a whole, but I kind of just wanted to toss in a lot of other um, areas here on this last slide. Um, so those are some of the big areas I wanted to bring up here. And um, we'll move into the questions now on this slide. So that was the last slide. So any questions in relating to these outside factors, shoot them my way. Any questions about um, trading at all, regardless if it's related to these three topics, shoot them my way. Once I, we finish questions on here, we'll move into off topic questions and then technically end the seminar, but start the rest of the stream. So I'll answer some questions that already came in. Um, so don't trade if you don't see the enemy jungler. It depends on what um, what jungler it is and so on. Like if you expect the enemy jungler to be ganking or not, what time in the game it is, where you expect him to be and so on. <laughs> Vice, I am the best duo lane. That's an interesting one. Can't confirm. All right, guys. Fire away. Trading the create timing news, does that include, say, you are a Zed um, player and you know you'll be able to kill them at six? But if you trade them favorably, say, at, say level five? Yes. That does include that. Is that why the pro players always go in teams at level one to know where the enemy jungler starts? That is a big reason why, yes. To understand where the enemy jungler is so their solo lanes can trade around winning matchups? Yes, absolutely. It's a good call. These windows are created by ability cooldowns. Generally speaking, yes, but it could also be summoner spell cooldowns. It could also even be like um, just even wave situation, forcing a trade to push out the wave. What about if some champs are good at short trades while others are good at longer ones? Um, that's that's That falls into the nature of the matchup, but that's something to consider as well, yes. How can you bait the enemy champ into trading with you when the jungler is near? Well, if the enemy champion beats you in trades, then you just try to take a trade. If they if they don't beat you in trades, then the best way is actually walking away and getting them to walk up further. So they're not scared of you. They're not afraid of your zone because you're back up further, so they can walk into your zone and then your jungler can gank. I will sometimes trade with the jungler when he ganks because I know I can chunk him down, even though it'll get me low and have to back possibly losing XP gold. Is that worth to do so? Mentally I tell myself I can help him. No. 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 Um, Elvis. Mainly due to the fact that this sounds pretty crappy, but as a player, you should be very selfish. So unless your win condition, um, as a champion you are playing, scales very well and you aren't going to lose that much, that's okay. But I know the champion you play, and as the champions that you majority play, that is not the right way of the playing. In the large majority, in general, I'd almost say no always, actually. No. Because junglers have a lot of like ways of healing up, too. He may have two potion charges. He may have smite to go heal up, um, as an example. So there's a lot of ways junglers can heal quickly. So definitely a bad strategy. I, I get why you do it, but it's a bad strategy, especially for solo queue. In SKT versus Flash was day one. Rift Rivals, everyone in SKT had refill. Well, even Wolf who had Biscuit Mask. When did they buy them? It's a good question. Um, and a good topic too. Is it worth trading your team dying for you to stay top lane and get a tower? Um, if it's first blood turret gold, um, kind of. First back, interesting. Um, 
I'm assuming that they planned, they wanted to stay on the map for a long time. So I'm ass- like, it's probably due to the fact that they probably already had like effective HP advance, but they want even more effective HP advantage. I'm ass- they probably took a lot of priority in getting like those turrets quick to snowball the game. I'd have to see the comp, but I'm assuming that may be the reason why. Um, what situations should you get refillable over potions? Refillable over potions generally means that you're going to be trading a lot. It's also super nice on champions with teleport or easy ways of getting back in the lane quickly. Um, in terms of laners, junglers should always get it. Also, um, since we're already getting to it, we can allow off-topic questions. But before we jump into off-topic question, guys, I'm going to reboot the stream real quick. So I'm just essentially going to start and like turn it off and turn it back on real quick. So we'll be right back just for the VOD purposes so I can upload it to this YouTube without it dragging on too long. So be right back and we'll continue like to ask any type of questions you want. 